So thanks, Sam, and thanks to everyone for uh, the organizers for organizing this wonderful workshop. Thanks to all of you for coming. Um, so this talk is from somewhat old slides, as some of you might have noticed. I had to change my affiliation because I forgot to <laughs> do that. That is the talk which is older than that. Uh, it says two decades of property testing, which is actually much more than two and a half decades by now, and it's increasingly getting older. And let me just briefly tell you about this problem and its uh, thing. So let me start with you know the big data problems, and these problems have existed for a long time, even though only now have we started making money out of it. Uh, but in those days, actually maybe people did make some money. Uh, Tycho Brahe, uh, astronomer from the uh, <coughs> late uh, mid to late 16th centuries, he wanted to measure you know planetary motion accurately, and that was his principal goal. He set up all of these, uh, uh, I mean, he set up all of this infrastructure and was collecting a huge amount of data. Uh, his goal was to prove that the sun revolved around the earth and so he was compiling all this data one day he would be able to prove this hypothesis was his goal but he passed away unfortunately sometime in the middle of this research but during this period actually he did <coughs> end up using a fair amount of money 10 percent of the Danish GNP, uh, GDP in those days um, um, good chunk of money. Um, he did not manage to fulfill his quest uh, but Johannes Kepler in turn <coughs> carried on this research uh, some say that he actually stole the data from, um, uh, from Kepler and uh, he did not believe in Tycho Brahe's picture which was that uh, the sun was revolving around the earth but he had a, a Copernicus's picture which was the planets including the earth are moving around the sun uh, in circular orbits and uh, he also had a very very specific um, um, uh, 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 conjecture about the ratio of the radii. So each planet was moving in an orbit of a certain radius and the next planet's radius would be defined by circumscribing a uh, uh, regular solid around this one and then putting a <coughs> circle circumscribing the next one and this ratio was what he thought was the uh, correct ratio and he tried to prove this and uh, of course he used Brahe's data in order to do this and worked on it for nine full years before he realized that actually okay this was not the right picture the right picture is really uh, uh, elliptical orbits and uh, along the way he sort of started discovering the laws of planetary motion. So all of this is very impressive what is very impressive for us today is the fact that it took 9 years to be able to come up with this thing to be able to refute some of these basic hypotheses that were sitting out there which were wrong okay and in general this is a uh, you know the challenge of analyzing a lot of big data is not as much I think in the task of figuring out what is the right hypothesis once you have got the right hypothesis class as in ruling out the wrong hypothesis classes. You sit around you say okay here is this thing and in order to refute it you have to pretty much say well let me find the best fitting hypothesis from this class maybe it is very hard to fi fi figure it out. It takes a lot of time to figure out this best fit hypothesis you know if, you're, if a hypothesis takes n bits to describe takes you at least n time to write the hypothesis down. Then you write it down and you realize oh it was wrong. So now everything is thrown out you start with a new slate now this is a new hypothesis class I am going to look at it again. So would not it be great to be have a process by which you do not try to learn the hypothesis first and then test it okay. So it sounds like a, you know when learning is expensive and it is all wasted you know what was the point in finding the best fitting hypothesis if nothing fits nicely. But on the other hand you know trying to do learning before uh, testing before you learn um, seems like you know putting the uh, I do not know what, cart before the horse or some such thing it seems just the wrong order to do things. So it just sounds like a ridiculous possibility but turns out this is exactly what we want to do in property testing. You have a large class of hypotheses describing any single hypothesis is going to take an extremely long time some function which is going to grow with the complexity of the hypothesis class and yet you want to say is there a hypothesis in this class that fits my data or not in time which takes a constant amount of time nothing to do with the scale of the complexity of the hypothesis class. This is what we want to do and the question is can you do it. So I will start talking about proper definitions shortly and by the way most of this talk is just a survey about what kinds of results exist there is very little in the way of theorems there might be one sort of a little lemma that whose proof I inserted yesterday but 
in general, this is not really proof heavy. It's mostly about different kinds of uh, uh, results that exist and a certain perspective that I like to advocate. All right, so property testing is a special class of a broader class of algorithmic uh, inquiries, which is sublinear time algorithms. Okay. These are algorithms which want to run in time which is smaller than the length of the input, smaller than the length of the output. Okay. How could you have algorithms which actually do this? And if you look around you, you you'll realize that actually there are algorithms like this that are sitting there and running right now in the world because you run a Google web search. I mean, it's supposed to be talking about the internet as a whole, clearly did not take that entire input in in order to answer your query. It just took some snapshot of it, used something, some information that it knows about it, produces a thing. And you could run a list of all possible queries that are out there on this uh, algorithm, but in for each the the, uh, the entire function that Google computes or some search engine computes is a huge output, huge input function. But you are only interested in one coordinate of the uh, output, and you are happy to sample the input. And this is a canonical form of algorithmics today, but that's the kind of algorithm that we are talking about. So algorithms that will not actually read the entire input. By the way, I, uh, which is the laser? Thing here. Uh, ah, okay, so, so by nature these algorithms have to be probabilistic because they cannot, if they are not looking at the entire input and they are always looking at some very weird portion of the input, they might be easily fooled into giving the wrong answer. They will not be correct in computing any function on the input that is given to them. Their goal is to be correct on after you change the input slightly. Okay. So, they would the only guarantee that they will say is well I may not be computing f of x if the function f is what you are interested on the input x which is what you have given me, but I am actually computing f of x prime where x prime is very close to x. If that is good enough for you great, if not then you should not try to do sublinear time algorithms. This is all you can get out of sublinear time algorithms, but even this is not a trivial objective because functions might be actually very hard and f of x prime on x prime close to x may be very useful, but still may be hard to compute. And they will always assume random access to input, meaning x is not, you're not working in the Turing machine model where you have to scan x from left to right, but you can just go in and say read me coordinate i of x and you get charged one unit of cost for this. Okay. Similarly, they will only provide random access to the output. You do not say I will give you the enumeration of all the bits of the output. Instead, any one coordinate of the output you want, I can give it to you it will be done. Okay. This is the model of computing which is I think the right model for algorithmics today. Many very interesting tasks can be solved and may a large subclass of tasks which can be solved over here are under the category of property testing and that is the kind of thing that we will be talking about today. So, what is property testing? It is just the restriction of sublinear time algorithms to the class of problems which are decision problems where you are given an input, the output is of length 1 as of is a single bit yes or no and you are just trying to compute this one bit on the uh, this one boolean function and you would now like I mean you can obviously you do not care about running in time which is larger than the output length, but you still want to be sublinear in the input length makes sense. Now, <coughs> so what is a decision problem? How does it relate to learning? This the previous example was basically asking the question, I have some data, I have this class of all possible concepts which is huge, is there a concept in there which is close to describing my data or exactly describes my data? Is planetary motion described by a collection of orbits with planets going around the earth or going around, are they circular? What is the radii of the circles? This depends on the actual hypothesis you pick from the class. The class of our uh, hypotheses is different circular orbits. Okay. So, these are the kinds of questions that we might be interested in answering. Can you have efficient algorithms which do that? Okay. And the amazing fact is that many, many non trivial algorithms exist. Okay. And I will try to give you a brief example of, you know, brief series of such examples and tell you a little bit about what kinds of theories are emerging over here. Now, the first of these examples is the first that you might think of. This was the most basic and natural example. It has 
this is the foundation of statistics as it exists today. I am looking at a population and I would like to know is the majority of the population going to vote for red or for blue. Okay. Now, this is a question under which we do not really care for exact answers as much if we, we know that exact computation is it exactly 50 percent or one element in the population more than 50 percent is going to take a lot of time. So, we are happy enough if you can separate 55 percent of the people voting for red from 55 percent voting for blue. If these two cases can be separated maybe we are happy. So, this is the kind of question that we would like to answer. So, you could think of it as the concept class consists of all possible. So, uh, every function the functions here that I would be like to be thinking about are the votes for each member of the population is a fun is a element of the domain who do they vote for is given by this function value and I would like to separate the class of functions where a majority of, of the population is voting blue which means majority of the values of the functions are blue for, uh, or sorry majority is red from the case where at most 49 percent is red okay, or something like that. So, that is the class of this is the separation I would like to have. Now, we we know from the from standard tail inequalities laws of large numbers Chernoff bounds whatever you want to that if you want to test whether alpha is greater than 0.5 or alpha is less than 0.5 minus epsilon we can do this by random sampling we do not have to go to every member of the population and sample them. And in fact, the sample size only needs to be you know proportional to 1 over epsilon squared where epsilon is our confidence uh, is the is the separation bar that we have. In particular the important thing is it does not even scale with the size of the population it does not scale with the number of people in the uh, that we that are potentially eligible to vote. And these are the kinds of algorithms that we consider sort of optimal the best that we can hope for where the uh, ability the the the, the number of the sample size that we are looking at scales by only the level of separation that we care for here and does not care at all about the size of the domain, the size of the domain of the functions. Okay. So, there are many other examples in statistics if you want to compute the mean of the population, if you want to compute the variance, any other things, these are all can be done with similar uh, analysis, similar uh, bounds. And, uh, and yet somehow we think that this is a fairly limiting class of functions that you might want to compute. Okay. So, in this rest of the talk what I will try to describe is some very radically different kind categories of functions uh, of properties that we can actually test very efficiently. And I will also try to emphasize why it is mathematically that these were much much more exciting than this first class of results. This was exciting for that generation no doubt about it it was a revelation that you could actually sample a constant fraction of the population and start estimating. But there is much 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 more that can be done and algorithmics often deals with much 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 more complicated analyses and that is what we want to be talking about in the rest. Okay. And by the way as in all other talks please feel free to interrupt at any stage with questions if something is not clear and so on. All right. Now, the first of the radical departures is going to be the following. I want to ask the question I given a function I am given a function is it roughly linear in a multivariate function is it roughly linear in its parameters okay. or in the way we will I will describe these results I want to think of the function as mapping from a finite group to a finite group it is a generalization of linearity. And I would like to understand this is this function really a homomorphism or not homomorphism between groups or not if you were thinking over the reals this would really correspond to linearity or something like that over where if g was a real vector space and h was a reals. But we cannot deal with it today because this these are infinite groups and today we will only talk about finite groups. But if you want you can plug in g being a finite vector a vector space over a finite field and h could be a finite field this would make perfect sense in general any group to any group is it a homomorphism or not. Okay. So, what is a so a homomorphism if you recall is just a function which satisfies for every x and every y the property that f of x times f of y equals f of x times y. Okay. I am using the multiplicative notation, but 
The results hold for that, but when I talk about proofs, I might often do additive case only, the uh, commutative groups only. Okay? A very natural test proposes itself. Why don't we just test this identity for a randomly chosen pair x and y? In the case of finite field, uh, in the case of finite groups, what do I mean by a random element? It's just a uniform element from this finite set. Okay? Nothing particularly devious about it. And <coughs> a remarkable result, I mean, okay, this is not the remarkable result. If your function is a homomorphism, it's clear that you're going to actually accept with probability one. Okay? It's not, nothing, every x and y should satisfy this, and that's all you're going to do. A really remarkable result, even though, you know, when the first, this result came around, it was really hard to grasp this question. What was the question that was asked? And how was it different from the answer that you're giving? And it took us a long time to convince people that actually this was a remark, this was a non-trivial statement. But it is a very, very, very non-trivial statement. And it says that a function that is actually uh, far from being a homomorphism, meaning I have to change its value in many places in order to get a homomorphism, would also satisfy the feature that for many choices of x and y, for a large fraction of choices of x and y, with high probability over x and y, f of x times f of y would not equal f of x times y. So if you ran this test, you would detect it with high probability. Now the very important thing over here, if I think of g as an n-dimensional vector space, and h as the vector uh, over, over some field, finite field, and h is that finite field itself. In order to figure out what, learn what is the fu nearest function f, which nearest homomorphism would take you at least n units of time. You have to describe the n coefficients. But this test looks at three values of the function and that's it. Okay? And for these three values, it immediately concludes that if you were far from being a homomorphism, you would have detected it. If you're close, you three is not a function of n. Okay. The distance here is kind of Hamming distance, or what? Okay, the distance is going to be Hamming distance. Just what fraction of values do I have to change the function, and how much do I have to change? I do not care. Just how, on how many inputs I have to change. It's Hamming distance is all we'll be measuring. Thanks. Uh, the analysis of the linearity test, let me say a few words about it, I'll probably do a couple of pages over here, uh, has to look at the following question, I mean the, the hard part of the thing was suppose I'm given a function which usually passes a test, okay, so if I pick a random x and a random y with 99% for of choices of x and y, this is the case that f of x times f of y equals f of x times y. I'd like to say I can change the value of the function at a few places and get another function g which will satisfy this identity 100% of the times. Okay. It's not a trivial statement because for some choices of x I might want to be close to this homomorphism, for some other choices I might want to be close to that other homomorphism. Do all these different local views co become coherent and together and become one big homomorphism? A priori it should not be clear. Okay. And we will show that actually such a function exists, or I won't show it, but I'll tell you, tell you what such a function should work. The first thing is, if there is going to be a homomorphism nearby, it has to be this guy. Okay. This function has to be the function that will work. Why? You can prove that if f was close to homomorphism, then the following way of recovering the value of the function g at x is going to be a homomorphism. So, if anything works, this function g has to work because if f was close, then g would be homomorphism. What's this function g? It'll say, suppose I want to compute the value of g somewhere, pick a random point r, look at f at r, take it f of r inverse and multiply it with f of x times r. Okay? We know that for, you know, for functions which are homomorphisms, I mean, this would be a random point, this would be a random point, and this ratio should be, you know, close to the homomorphism value. So, these two are both equaling the value of the homomorphism, and if it was a homomorphism, then this ratio should equal to g. So, this has to be the function that will work. Question is, can we actually prove, without assuming that f is close to a homomorphism, that g is a homomorphism? We would need to prove that, and also prove that g is close to f. Okay. Two things, if we can prove both of these, then we are done. 
Well, proving g is close to f is easy. Why? Because what our test usually did is pick a random x and a random r and check to see that f of x times f of x times r equals I mean f of x equals the right hand side. So, if for random x and r we you know usually have equality then for typical x's I do not have to change its value I, or this operation does not change its value and it is a very simple averaging argument you are done. What is hard is zero step we should say that it is well defined. Uh, right, actually it may not be well defined, but I would basically have to uh, in fact that is exactly I mean I am going to talk about the zeroth step that Sasha is describing. Why is it hard to prove that G is a homomorphism? A priori it is not even clear that when I pick a random R and look at this value and a random S and look at the same value, pick the worst possible X, okay. any choose any arbitrary X. If it turns out that 50 percent of the R's are suggesting one value F of X times r times f of x r f of r inverse is some value another 50 percent are suggesting some other value which value should you take or even worse maybe one third of the choices of r suggest one value one third suggests some other value and another third suggests a third value which of these three is going to give you a homomorphism certainly not you know you cannot have two of these values be this correspond to a homomorphism it must be that there is an overwhelming majority for this one value that has to be a necessary condition, but that turns out like that is the essence of the condition that we want to prove that is really almost everything we want to prove. So, why should it be that for any x for every x for random choices of r and s these two values are high equal with very high probability. Okay. This is the essence of the question and this is what I will try to tell you in a couple of slides turns out for this one it is actually fairly simple analysis which proves this. Anybody having any questions? So, I am going to ask you the, the question for every x, why is the probability over r and s of this equality high? Okay. So, this is a new element in the analysis and before I give you the proof of how to do this analysis, I want to stress a change that has happened. Okay. There is this measure which says f of x usually satisfies this identity. Is this true or not about f it is easy to measure you just pick a random choice of x and y and say is this satisfying this identity. And a second identity which says is f close to some function g that always satisfies that identity. Okay. I am sorry uh, close to a g oh that should be a g right yeah that should be a g sorry. Now, when we were doing the population testing and as a majority red or a majority blue we said is the population close to being 50 percent red is the population voting function close to a function which is you know where you know when I pick a random person and I ask the question are you red or blue would it be the case that by you know for most of the people I am saying red or so for at least you know, close to 50 percent of the people I am saying red or I can ask the question is the function something that I can change to one by changing few values and then get 50 percent reds these two the blue questions over here are actually the same they are not they are semantically syntactically the same question. The red questions are not the same it takes a proof to go from this red statement which is measurable to this red statement which does not a priori look measurable and this is what makes linearity testing and its analysis hard and in fact I would say the essence of all of property testing is when there is a gap between these two versions of the questions. This is a conceptual point I hope it is clear this is what we want to really stress. There is the same notions for the polling not the same notions for homomorphism. Okay. Now, here is the very short proof of this identity that we claim uh, sorry uh, right. So, we are assuming that you have a function f which when you plug in x and y at random and you ask the question is f of x times f of y equal to f of x times y then with high probability you get uh, the uh, identity or with very low probability you get a lack of I mean you get a separation. Okay. The probability is some epsilon I claim if that is the case then the probability over r and s no matter what x I choose of this identity holding or this identity not holding is at most twice epsilon. Okay. It is not the same epsilon it is twice, but that is what happens. 
Now, why is this? Very simple, you know. I can look at fix an x and look at this quantity f of x times r times f of s. By the way, I am going to do this for the case of the abelian thing. There is a proof which works for the non-abelian case and Amir Spielka is one of the authors of that paper, but I am not going to do that. It is just a little easier to do this. It fits more easily in a couple of lines here. Um, so, f of x times r times f of s, I mean and these are all abelian, so you know they will all everything that you want to commute will commute. And our test really said well this quantity should equal that with probability all but epsilon, right. So, this is just natural. So, the fact that x is worst case does not bother me, x times r is a random element, s is a random and independent element, so this identity. The same reasoning tells me that f of x times s times f of r is also equal to f of x times r times s. And notice that the right hand side on the two cases is the same for a abelian case. So, what I conclude is that with probably and these are not independent events, but even if they were mutually exclusive if by the union bound the probability that either one of these happens is at most 2 epsilon. And if neither happens I have this quantity equals that which is equivalent to that identity I want ok. So, when you can work out the calculation it works out. There is a little bit of an algebraic miracle that has happened here and this miracle supports property testing for this case and it was probably an element essential element ok. So, that is as much as I am going to do and this is probably the last proof in the in the talk. So, this turns out to be the essence of the linearity analysis and immediately one gets works ahead and gets the full outcome. Okay. So, let me give you a very brief history of property testing in its modern incarnation not including the old statistical you know and random sampling techniques. So, the first of these uh, modern property tests was this linearity test that I mentioned due to Blum, Luby and Rubinfeld happened in the spring or stock of 90 and they gave linearity testing in many applications to what they call testing correctness of programs, program testing. Uh, a little later, but independently because these people really I mean these results were really disconnected at those times, but by Fortnoy and Lund in Fox 90 gave a test for a different class of functions called multilinearity and I would not describe it very precisely, but different property and how to test this. And again very remarkable property test with major applications to what is called PCPs today, but in those days they called it MIP multiple prover interactive proofs. Uh, with Rubinfeld later when we were trying to generalize linearity when we said well you know if you look at linearity in the case where the domain is a vector space over a finite field and the range is the finite field well the set of functions that you are testing is polynomials of degree at most 1. Why do not we extend it to polynomials and many variables of higher degree? We started exploring this question and along the way we define the broad class of property testing. and. Uh, <coughs> Subsequently, Goldreich, Goldwasser and Ron really sort of took this property testing out of this very limited algebraic context and said well it could be applied to any class of properties, graph properties, statistical properties and they started doing a very systematic study. And this led to a burst of activity and since then we have been able to see tests for many many classes of properties, graph properties, statistical properties, matrix properties, properties of Boolean functions etcetera, etcetera, etcetera. And we saw talks about sparse graph property testing some of which was predated by work on graph property testing which I will mention briefly. And uh, there was also a little bit of a footnote more algebraic properties this is the kind of stuff that I am really most interested in and some of this talk is actually you know trying to understand what were all these results looking like why they you know some of this generalities that we saw here did not happen here and how to push some of the you know get similar generalities here. All right. So, in the next like maybe 10 15 minutes in the talk what I am going to give you is just examples of different kinds of properties that are tested and I hope you will find it compelling that property testing is both rich in results and in mathematics I mean deep theories are being applied developed in order to get these results. So, a very a broad class of property testing talks about testing properties of graphs your input here is a graph and what you would like to know is does the graph come close to satisfying some property that you are interested in. 
So the property should be a collection of graphs that contain them and uh, so that is what you would like to do. Okay. Now in these for this part because I am talking about property testing for dense graphs our model of input is going to be very simple I am given the adjacency matrix of a graph and distance between graphs would be just what fraction of the adjacency matrix what how, can I change less than epsilon n squared entries to go from a graph that is given to me to one which actually has the property. So very simple crude model. One of the most basic things that one could ask for so, so here is a very simple example I have a graph I can ask the question is there a triangle in this graph okay. three vertices does it contain a clique of size three okay. and uh, it turns out very innocuous looking question very natural test what is the most natural test you can think of pick a random triple of vertices is there a triangle pick another random triple of vertices is there a triangle keep doing this or maybe you pick randomly sample a constant number of vertices in the graph look at the induced subgraph and see if there is a triangle there okay. any of these things you could try and this is pretty much the only thing you can imagine could work and actually it is the only thing you could hope either this works or nothing does but it is not clear that this should work and one of the deep results over here uh, is that actually yes this is a good test and this is I believe it is a an analysis due to alone and Shapira did I get the no. Right, so, okay, so good. Uh, this particular variant of the question not phrased in the language of distance uh, of testing a graph, but actually just asking the question. If I have a graph and it has a large number of triangles in it or a large number of edges are involved in triangles, then it should have a large number of triangles. That is roughly what we want to say. This kind of results were actually explored in graph theory and proved in the uh, 80s or maybe 70s by Riddle and Rusa or maybe. Uh, but the modern canonical proof or analysis of almost any result of this form is uses what is called the Semiradis regularity lemma which says if I take a graph I can partition it into a constant number of pieces and between any two of these pieces I have a bipartite graph between them this graph will be more or less random with the density with the only thing being that the density will be sort of different for these different random graphs. Okay. So I take a graph I partition into 10 pieces between piece 1 and piece 2 I have a random graph of edge density 10 percent between piece 1 and piece 3 I have a random graph of edge density 20 percent etc etc etc. So roughly this is what so it looks almost random for a particular notion of randomness. And what this allows one to prove and this is not trivial at all is to say that if your graph had many triangles in it then it would must be the case that three of these quasi random looking partitions actually contain a triangle and so in fact now because of randomness you can say that if I pick a random triple of vertices with constant probability there will be a triangle amongst them. Very non trivial both the regularity lemma and its application to this case but put together it gives you an analysis of the triangle freeness testing in graphs. Okay. So you can see you know looks nothing like the proofs and the analysis of linearity testing and but property testing can work in this setting also and it is a remarkably uh, you know both useful result you know I am looking at a graph locally and I am able to conclude some global property. and the analysis is extremely clever mathematically. All right, so here is a so like I said, I'm just going to keep jumping from classes of questions to the kinds of you know results that are known there, and I'll then try to tell you a little bit about a unifying framework that I'm trying to advocate. So here is a property of functions that I might want to and this is a by the way it is a very 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 common phenomenon right. We would like to know given the genomes of various organisms etc etc and some diseases that they are showing is there a small set of genes that are actually affect you know causing this disease. So I have a function which says given the, the genetic code the gene, gene sequence uh, does this person have the disease or not. What I would like to know is it really being caused by a small number of features or is it really some much more you know, broader property. This property is 
cast in the framework of junta testing can be cast in the framework of junta testing given a function on many variables n variables and it is a boolean function do I have the disease or not and maybe all these you know each one of these n coordinates stands for a different gene do I have that gene or not and is it does it depend on very few coordinates if you want to test for it on being just a is the function a function of only one of these variables that would be called dictator testing and uh, it was something that we studied in the context of PCPs in work with Bellare and Goldreich and later Hostad gave a be very beautiful test which is you know flourished uh, of late and in the case of uh, more variables if you are allowed to you know I have this function on n variables but I want to know is it de only depend on three coordinates or not then it is called junta testing and then there is this work of Fisher, Kindler, Ron, Samorinitsky and somebody <laughs> sorry uh, who am I forgetting all right uh, and uh, there have been lots of work in this direction as well and Safra good yes thanks <laughs> thanks and you know this is perhaps the most interesting example where I would love to be able to do the testing before the learning thing and uh, okay. uh, this uh, class of properties has a very nice sort of a fuzzy test it is very hard to say what it accepts and what it rejects in this thing but for the uh, thing let me just describe the test to you roughly what it says is the following I will pick a random coordinate on 0 1 to the n by the way this does not apply to the date the genome examples because over there you do not have random access to this function you cannot just say I produce the following gene and let me te tell me whether this individual with this gene has this disease or not. So, it is a little remote from that setting, but still I mean the, the problem is of that nature unfortunately the access model is not of the same nature, but if in the case where you have actually random access to this function this is the test you pick a random vector x n dimensional uniformly from this domain and then perturb every co coordinate of it with some very tiny probability epsilon. Now, if this function only depends on one variable with high probability you have not changed that variable and so the probability that f of x equals f of y should be at least epsilon. On the other hand if the function depends on many variables you can prove, but it takes a significant amount of effort to prove and depending on the exact nature of the theorem you want takes more and more work. It turns out that if f depended on many coordinates then f of x would actually be different from f of y. In fact, as the number of things gets larger and larger and larger you go from rather f of x being equal to f of y with probability epsilon you go to f of x being equal to f of y with probability at not being equal to f of y with probability almost square root of epsilon and this gap is almost the best you can hope for and this analysis is uh, you know in the analysis over here involves Fourier analysis influence of variables hypercontractivity there is a new theorem in the area called uh, the invariance principle and so on and applies a fair heavy duty collection of techniques there is a beautiful book by uh, Ryan O'Donnell sort of focusing on many of the techniques in this area which sort of talks about how to test this class of properties and many other um, applications of harmonic analysis much of which might have been you know harmonic analysis as seen by computer scientists has had two different ap motivations one was to study uh, distributed computing and some of the ability of individual players to influence the output of many player computations and the other has been property testing and has led to a very beautiful rich body of results. So, not done yet I am still going to go on a couple of more examples and by the way at any stage if you want to ask questions feel free I will be happy to tell you more. Distribution testing yet another beautiful wonderful and completely natural class of things in fact uh, uh, let me see yeah so you are given samples of from some unknown distribution ok. So, the distribution is supported on some n elements in the universe and uh, you might be asking questions like is the distribution a high entropy distribution or not ok or you might ask the question is this distribution uniform distribution or not. So, uh, one of the applications I mean the, one of the people who 
initiated this line of work, one of the papers that initiated this line of work is Batu et al. One of the authors here is Ranit Rubinfeld, who actually applied this thing to see if uh, lotto results, you know, lottery results in the New Jersey lottery over the years between A and B were actually picking random numbers or not. Yeah, are they uniformly random or not? So, you know, it is a very natural thing. You know, if these things are not picking uniformly random numbers, then you have a advantage and you probably have some way of getting be guessing better on uh, a win on the lottery. I do not know what the outcome of their study was, but this is what you want to study. But in order to see if, so, so what is the model here? I keep, uh, there is a box, I press a button, out comes a random number between 1 and 10. Press the button again, independent random sample between the, from the same distribution. So, IID copies in identical but independent copies from the same distribution again and again and again. And I would like to know some property of the underlying distribution. Is it uniform? Is it close to being high entropy, etcetera, etcetera, etcetera. Okay. And uh, beautiful collection of results starting with work of. Uh, so, if you want to test if this distribution is uniform, this is roughly what you should do. You should not try to sort of see how often the first element comes, how often the second element comes, third, etcetera, etcetera, and go on all the way up to n. Because that will try to, if you want to get each one of these estimates very accurate, takes you about n log n samples to get all the estimates to be very accurate. Okay. Instead, what you should do is measure how many collisions there were on these things. If you were on a random, uniformly random samples, after square root of n samples you expect to see a collision, after square root of n log n samples you expect to see maybe log n collisions or something something. You can write down a formula for how many collisions, what is the distribution of collisions that you expect to see. If that quantity is roughly right after about square root of n times log n queries or something, then this distribution is close to uniform. Is If not, it is not. That is the test. And all of these tests and analyses with a very, very, very sort of comprehensive statement over here, any symmetric properties of distributions, distribution, a property of distributions is symmetric if it does not depend on how much probability I assign to 1 versus 2 or 2 versus 1, right. You know, all the, you know, names are the same. What is the distance between distributions? Ah, the distance between distributions is the total <coughs> variation distance between distributions. Uh, you just view it as a probability vector and in L1 space and you measure that. Okay. Okay. Uh, these results are not due to the same valiant as an Amir stock. This one is due to Paul valiant and this is due to Paul and Greg valiant, valiant squared. And they tell you that actually for any symmetric properties of distributions, you do not have to actually make even n samples. We were thinking of n or n log n as a good way of measuring, you know, estimating the distribution. But to determine any symmetric property, it only takes you n over log n samples, which is a really non-trivial statement. And by the way, of the collection of things that I know about, this is the result that I know least about. It is actually still a bit of a mystery to us as to why we were able to get this log n savings, factor savings in this thing. It is a beautiful collection of results, uses some multivariate central limits, Stein's method, Hermite polynomials, etc., etc. I mean, you know, the kitchen sink from statistics and inference are being thrown at this class of problems. Okay. So, we have seen a lot of examples of property testing questions and results, each one of which is very interesting. Each time we are asking the question, here is this sort of some massive kind of data described typically for me by a function which says, you know, on various coordinates I tell you what the thing is. And I would like to know does it satisfy some property or not. They come from a very diverse collection of motivations, a diverse collection of techniques are being applied. And so, for me when you know I sort of wrote this paper with Ronit many years back and saying here is property testing and then I look at all this work, it made no sense to me. All of these papers were just individual completely different in its own space. So, I could ask this question what is property testing and so if you you know. I hope, I mean, no, I guess this is not a country with elephants, so uh, this may not be a popular fable here, but in India where I come from, this is a well known story. If you ask, you know, five blind men what is an elephant, this one looks at this part of the elephant and says it looks like a snake to me, that one says it is a tree, that is a cave, it is a branch, it is a mountain, etcetera, etcetera. Same thing happens with property testing. When you ask what is property testing, you know, Ryan says this is all about analysis of Boolean functions. 
Uh, if you ask someone who's working in matrices and you know like uh, Vempala or Ravi Kanan, they'll say oh, it's all about matrices and linear algebra. Or if you ask the Valiant or Runit, they'll say well it's all cent statistics and central limit theorem or graphs and regularity, etc., etc. So we have a paper saying it's all about regularity. <laughs> okay. So this is uh, what the f you know. The, the, the world of status property testing looks like and you know it seems very diverse and the one thing that I'd like to describe to you in the rest of the talk uh, is basically one way of it's not going to unify everything the fact that there are many different techniques implies there are many different techniques I don't think there's any reduction which says I can derive the uh, Stein's method from uh, regularity lemma okay so these are different things why are they different is probably what we want to answer and I'll try to do that. And let me use sort of, you know, a particular family of results that I really love, which is this result due to Alon, Fisher, Ilan and uh, uh, Asaf Shapira, which says that if a graph property is testable in my universe, dense graph, I'm allowed to change epsilon n squared entries to go from a graph which doesn't have a property to a graph which does, this is a property which is determined essentially by this regularity uh, lemma. Okay. And this was something that was suggested already in work of Goldreich, Goldwasser and Ron, but really I mean it takes a lot of work to be able to prove this. In particular it says that every hereditary property is actually testable because those properties are determined by regularity. It's a very nice characterization of testability. Okay. It's uniform test for all graph properties. You just say if I want to test a property I pick a random sample of the vertices, look at the induced subgraph and then do something. And what? Maybe not determined, but it's a single analysis which works. It doesn't matter whether you're trying to test is the graph triangle free or is it far from uh, you know being free colorable. The test and the analysis are all in the same paper and the one thing just as soon as you conclude that this property is regular, you have the, uh, the analysis. This is the kind of result that you would love to have. Why can't we have it for all of property testing? On the other hand, in the case of low degree testing, so here is this, the class of questions that I described to you. Given a function f from mapping from n variables over finite field on q elements, is its degree at most d or not? Uh, the blum luby rubinfeld paper dealt with d equal to 1. When you wanted to go to degree being up to field size over 2, then some, there are some other works. And then, uh, <coughs> you know, so analysis is like just like blum luby rubinfeld but then you have to change this and change that and change that. And then when you go to the degree being larger than the field size and the field size too, there is another sequence of analyses. And then again, you know the analysis is really like the previous ones but you have to change. And if the degree and the field size are all arbitrary then yet another analysis and yet another thing. It seems like we did not get the same unification at all in the algebraic case. It is not as if you say look here is the proof and just have to claim that you have properties within this class. So these are some of the things that motivated us and uh, when we were trying to figure out why there is no unification we hit upon some very nice concept which I think applies broadly to property testing. Um, there is a side on why low degree testing is an important class of properties but I think I will just skip it uh, for now. Instead. I will raise some other questions. So even before you start to talk about uh, linearity, uh, about the unification, there is this, you know, there was the old style of work on property testing which was, you know, statistics. Pick a random sample, estimate some property and then infer that the whole thing will work for that. And then we came up with these, you know, the linearity test, the graph property tests, the statistical tests and so on. They all looked very different, very uh, diff uh, Thing. What made this so different? Are we really on to a new class of problems or is it just that we are working hard because we are stupid? And then I mean why are the mathematical underpinnings of these different themes so different? We have already mentioned this. And uh, so you know, to me at least the last of these questions was very, very important. Why can I not get a nice unification of algebraic properties because especially coming from where I do where algebraic properties were actually very useful to test. So we started looking at this, all of this and then we realized that there was some very nice hidden uh, structural assumptions about many of these questions that we were raising which had not been explicitly 
mention and let me try and mention this now and this is the idea of a symmetry what we should really be looking at is the symmetry of properties so now let me formally define what a property is for me properties are always properties of functions these are functions from some finite domain to some finite range in the case of pop the populations and what people are voting the domain is the set of people the range is are they voting is red or blue are they voting red or are they writing blue in the case of uh, uh, graph property testing the domain is a pair of vertices and the range is 0 or 1 is that edge present or not etc 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 so any one of these things that i want to think about i think about it as a function or a, and a property is just given by a subset of functions which satisfy them okay now we can say talk about the automorphism class of a property which is this or what i call the invariance class here so we'll say that the property is invariant under a permutation pi a one to one function mapping the domain to itself if whenever a function satisfies the property and i rename the elements of the domain by this permutation then it still satisfies that property so this function is invariant under pi if this property holds for every f sorry this property satisfies pi if uh, is invariant under pi if the following equality holds okay now naturally the set of permutations under which the property is invariant forms a group you can compose these things and obtain this thing and uh, the I, while strictly speaking i should be talking about the maximal set of permutations under which are invariant i'll just talk about a set of permutations that preserve the property and try to understand different property testing uh, problems by this thing okay. and the main observation i mean i think this is really a nice one is the different property tests have been you know looking at very very different invariance classes so once you go down to an invariance class which is essentially the same then you probably can get apply the same sort of techniques if you go somewhere else then you more or less force to abandon everything else and go elsewhere but even more nicer observation i think is the fact that everything that was prior to blum lobby ruben felt the class of invariant the invariance class you were looking at was the complete symmetry group okay. that makes everything very 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 easy i mean I, really only thing that matters is a count of how many people how many things vote to value 1 how many go to value 2 etc and especially if your range is small then there's nothing really interesting to be said okay on the other hand when you start looking at linearity testing or even graph property testing this graph this universe of permutations is not everything and so you have to start developing new techniques and that's why we have new techniques and the reason we don't have the same techniques for the different areas is because these permutation classes are not the same so <clears throat> classical statistics was invariant under all permutations what about graph properties by definition we never asked the question what is a graph property but this is the definition of a graph property it is one which does not change when i permute the names of the variables uh, of the vertices right i mean i can't just say i'll look at a you know uh the uh, adjacency matrix write it down as a huge vector and ask the question is this accepted by the final automaton or not i mean that would be not a graph property i have to look at it a property which is invariant i permute all the vertices and the property should not change so that's a big group of invariances and whether you like it or not this is you know this is graph property testing so if there is success there it is attributable to this group boolean properties most of the things that we've been investigating under the concept and you know, under the harmonic analysis umbrella have been properties that have been invariant under renaming of variables okay so i can take you know are you a junta or not well you know i can rename the variables but if you are a function of k variables you're still a function of k variables It doesn't change and what about algebraic properties and this i'll tell you a little bit more about shortly but in the meanwhile the answers to the introspective question so the reason classical statistics was so much different and modern property testing is a richer collection a study is because the invariance classes are more narrow and that makes it much more interesting the reason that you have so many different techniques is there are different invariances and the context for algebra we'll see in a minute but 
So, this would be the right picture of the world of property testing it is over here you have permutations and variables for matrices there is we know the invariance class I just did not mention it before for uh, statistical properties you have the full group of symmetries and for graph properties you have invariance under renaming of the variables and by the way for sparse graph properties also you have the same thing you have some further the, the things that change there is the measure of distance and so on, but it is not really. Uh. So, for algebraic properties uh, and this is something that we did in the work with uh, Thali Kaufman, um, we started exploring this and we said well no, it is obvious what is the invariance class here, you just apply a linear transform to the variables, the degree of a polynomial does not change or even an affine transformation, the variable the degree does not go up. So, the property of being a polynomial of degree at most d is preserved when I do a affine substitution of the variables. I replace all variables by affine forms and other variables, does not change the total degree. It might reduce it, but it never increases it. So, that is the group that we should be looking at and the set of transformations we should be looking at as affine transformations of the domain. One thing that helps a lot in the analysis is also to view recall the fact that the set of properties that we are looking at are form a vector space. This is extremely immensely useful you can throw it away and get very 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 weak results or you can include it and get exceptionally strong results. So, in the rest of the talk I will try to focus mostly on the case where these are vector spaces. What do I mean by these are vector space? If I take two polynomials of degree d and I add them up I still get a polynomial of degree at most d. If I take a polynomial of degree d and multiply it by a constant, I still get a polynomial of a degree at most d. So, in that sense, this is a vector space over this over the field, the field which is the range of the property. Okay. If you put these two together, you start getting a very rich unification of algebraic property testing and many, many, many results that can be captured here. And I will try to tell you a little bit about these things, but before I tell you about this, I want to say something about the linearity property which is very 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 interesting. The usual view of property testing that is given to you is the following here is the space of all possible functions mapping the domain to the range. Here is some green set which we really care about the set functions which have the property. Because we are willing to sacrifice some error and you know if a function happens to be close to satisfying the property it is in a gray area we do not force to say yes or no. But if you are far you must say no, if you are in the set you must say yes. This is the view that you typically come up with for property testing and if you look at the property of being planar or of being well connected or of being free colorable they all look like this and very often these properties are even monotone. If I remove all vertices edges from the graph I will likely to preserve the property. So, in particular the empty graph has the property and everybody uh, every other graph which has a property is connected to this by you know the adjacency of one addition or uh, deletion of one edge. When it comes to linear properties when your domain is a vector space and your range is a field and you say the set of functions that I want to accept are all forming a you know linear subspace you no longer have this picture the picture you should really have is this the green set shatters, no two green points are close to each other and the region that you want to forbid is really these tiny you know uh, sorry this red region is what you want to forget, forbid, the green region is what you want to accept. Why? Because this is an error correcting code okay. that is the view that we really want to preserve and which is why I mean throwing away linearity often you know takes us to properties that are not interesting really want to preserve this and want to think about it. And keep the perspective that we are always talking of error correcting codes these have to be ok. Uh, I made a little bit I mean if I am talking of a property which is really really nicely testable then it is an error correcting code if not then you may be somewhat further away all right. So, why study affine invariance for us the first motivation was look I mean this is a generalization and captures the set of low degree polynomials, but it is a common abstraction of all the tests that were in the literature then and you know maybe we can go do something interesting by studying it together. In particular we were hoping that you could you know there were all these different proofs that were sitting around there was no 
obvious way of putting them together and gluing them. And so we said, well, maybe we should try and, you know, study all of those proofs in a single umbrella. And along the way, we would get a better understanding of algebraic property testing. And maybe, since we are now talking of error correcting codes, we would get new classes of codes which happen to have this testability property. This is something that I will talk about in a tutorial more later tomorrow. But uh, for, for this audience, let me just say that what do I mean by testable code? You know, you have property testing when applied to a property which is, consists, which is itself an error correcting code, functions which are in the space form an error correcting code. Testing tells you whether I'm close to being in the space or not. And that would just be a very natural, uh, it's a very natural feature to look for in error correcting codes. I give you a uh, disk, typically data is stored on disks is put in an error correcting code. Local testability would tell me I can quickly sample and see if too many errors have happened or not. Fairly reasonable property uh, feature to ask for. And if we could get new properties, then maybe we get some new error correcting codes as well. Okay. This was sort of some of the motivation. And I'm supposed to give you a summary of findings according to this thing. And I do have the time. I don't know if it will be too overwhelming. So I'll try to give you a little bit of a story about this and wrap up over that. Uh, even though I said these are some of the hopes and motivations, actually the reason we started, we came up with this thing was there was a conjecture in a work of Alone, Kaufman, Krivilevich, Litson and Ron, which said that, look, you know, if you happen to have a property, in order for to test a property, I have to be able to look at some, you know, I have this function, I want to know does it satisfy the property or not. I have only made a few probes into this function. Okay. I have looked at this value, that value, that value, that value. At this point, I have to make a decision, yes or no. And I'm going to be talking about one-sided error tests. So when I reject, I must be, I have to be absolutely sure that I'm doing the right thing. I should not accept, reject a function which is, which satisfies the property. So I've seen this local set of values. I've already seen enough to conclude that the function does not satisfy the property. In the case of linearity, what would you do? When did I reject? When I found an x and a y such that f of x times f of y was not equal to f of x times y. In the case of graph property testing, triangle freeness, when did I reject? I found three vertices that had a triangle amongst them. Okay. So these are, you know, I found a local constraint which was violated. So this constraint clearly is necessary for testing, more or less. Okay. If you want to do testing in a one-sided sense, you must have a local constraint. But, and what alone Kaufman, Krivilevich, Litson and Ron said was, well, you know, if you have local constraints and the property is also nicely symmetric. There they said, take any property you want, should be a vector space and it should be symmetric under, a, you know, sufficiently uh, rich group of symmetries. It should be actually immediately testable. So when we looked at this conjecture and this speci specific notion of symmetry was what they called two transitivity. He said, well, you know, I don't know much of group theory. I don't know any two transitive groups. And then we said, oh, okay, I know what two transitive, after looking at algebraic properties, I knew what two transitivity was. It was something implied by affine invariance. Okay. So we said, okay, affine invariance, I understand better. So let's look at properties that were invariant under affine transformations and see if the AKKLR conjecture is true. So we started exploring this thing and we could basically prove theorems which said that, well, yes, actually if you have local constraints then you get some local con testability, but the parameters were not as good as what the conjecture would have said. I mean, really depended a lot on the domain of the function space rather than the range, which is all the, which is what really would have been allowed by the conjecture. So it look, led us to future explorations of this space and after some amount of work, we gave two counterexamples, one in joint work with Grigorescu and Kaufman and the other with Ben Sasson, Matuk and Amir Spilka here, where we said, you know, weaker and weaker forms of the alone at all conjecture was actually false. So there are properties which are extremely locally characterized, have all the symmetries that you could hope for they are actually transitive over an affine group, but they are not locally testable. Okay. And there are two strong versions of this thing. So 
we started looking at this thing, our hope was to get a unification and so on, and far from unification we actually got negative results. But there was already in this positive results some unification that was going on and it has become stronger and stronger. There have been a huge class of investigations of low degree testing. How can I look at a function and tell is this a low degree polynomial or not and what kind of parameters I can get. And at this stage we are at, at a level where we can say almost every piece of success, almost everything can be attributed to just the fact that the, we are looking at functions which are invariant under the affine transformations of and the properties we are looking at are subspaces and these are good error correcting codes. I mean these three fac factors more or less explain everything we know about uh, low degree testing and all the results and PCPs etc cetera, etc cetera, that use them pretty much can be give, uh, obtained by these methods. Um, some very accidental positive results when we started looking at this thing we said well you know if we are believing that affine invariance is all that matters then all tests sh should probably be explained by the following you know should be captured by simpler tests. If I have a function of many 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 variables and I want to do some very local exploration of the function what should I do I should look at a function on a very low dimensional subspace you know if the only thing that I am allowed to rely on is that the space of properties is invariant under affine transformations this should be the natural class of tests and that should work. This turned out to be a philosophy that was extremely useful and turned out to tell us give us some of the state of the art testers for low degree polynomials uh, over very 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 small fields like fields of size 2, 3 etc etc. And it also gives us some of the um, you know <coughs> on the other hand uh, you know again so, so some very nice things. And also at the same time when we try to uh, um, find the best tests for low degree polynomials, I do not care about anything else, looking at it as a special case of affine invariant properties gives us much nicer, nicer structural results. So the, there are some very interesting uh, things that we are able to obtain over here. And for the most part these were still you know either we were reproving known results, unifying them or giving counter examples to extensions that were possible. And in fact for a long time it looked like we were mostly heading towards negative results till we came along with a very interesting feature. So this was uh, a concept called um, these were pa pa prob uh, you know we actually defined this operation to give a counter example to a certain conjecture about testability. Said here is a n very annoying way to construct properties which have lots of local constraints and are symmetric which is you start with a property on a few variables and then lift it to a property on many variables by just saying whenever I look to it small dimensional subspaces I get the small dimensional a property a function from the small dimensional space. So these lifted things looked very annoying they were giving us all kinds of obstacles to you know low degree testing and so on and they violated natural conjectures that we had they gave obstacles to you know thing. But um, on the you know so yeah the only nice thing was they gave a counter example to conjecture but um, <coughs> this was where we had left it and in fact we knew that this class of properties could be sort of so somewhat you know the, the annoyance had been noticed well earlier in some work that we did in 1995 where we noticed that if I take a function on many variables and I am trying to test is it a polynomial of degree at most d but d happens to be some number between the half the field size and the field size okay. A natural test would be let us look at it on every line and ask the question is it a function of degree at most d on every line. This was known not to work if the prime if the field was not a prime field but rather an extension of a field of characteristic 2 and it was known that this would not work. And in fact this was yeah I mean this sort of led us to lots of obstacles and so on. But uh, turns out that actually when you put the two things together you get fantastic positive news. Why? Because if you what you are interested in is testing the class of degree d polynomials this is a terrible test. It says you cannot restrict it to the lines and get anything interesting. You can ask instead what is the property that I tested by picking a random line 
it's a nice rich property it's invariant under affine transformations it is locally characterized it is testable by all the results that we already have and it turns out to be much 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 richer there are many 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 more code birds sitting here so this is a much richer code with all the nice features that we had it's just not the set of degree d polynomials so fine we will abandon that and just work with this and this has been a very profitable investigation of encoding theory and I'll tell you a little bit more about it in an unrelated talk tomorrow. So anyway, so this is as much as I wanted to say today. I'll conclude by just returning to the big picture. So first I find it very compelling to look at all of these results and property testing together. I mean it is a beautiful field and it's very nice to be able to say okay look and there is the reason for all this diversity and richness which is invariance. It's also it's telling us where the different classes are coming from and it would be very nice to say you know once I have many many different properties in the same class that are testable that there is a unifying thing. This is not yet known to be true. There are cases where we have unified results like graph property testing or now in algebra and so on but in for example Boolean function analysis we don't know that all the results that we the class of properties that can be tested can all be attributed to some handful of results and somehow we could get a unifying result over there. These kinds of things would be very nice and also I mean it is not going to be the case that once you have the invariance you have tests immediately. Once you have the invariance you get a better perspective of what to look for. Now you should say what else should I assume in order to get good testing and maybe in, the, in such cases you can say if I don't assume that I will not get good testing. It's possible those are the kinds of results that would be very nice. Um, in terms of where I would find most value in analysis in property testing, I would love to see some analysis of real valued functions on real domains. I mean there is a lot of investigation nowadays of functions which are defined on real inputs say on the unit sphere or some such thing and you know what kinds of properties do they have. The analysis for this class of things we don't have. I mean if you look at you know the Kepler problem and so on and so forth. I mean we really needed to look at it in the real space. That's where things are very interesting. There you would have to deal with not only Hamming errors but also the fact that you expect to see measurement errors on every value in the function. So to have a good theory which incorporates the two together would be extremely nice. Um, like I said earlier you know this invariance where the only uh, symmetries that we have are when I rename the variables the value of the, pro, uh, the feature of whether the function has a property or, or not does not change. Can we get a rich theory of property testing for them? I think it would be feasible but a lot needs to happen to get there. And in general you know for many of these inference problems that are being investigated actively in the literature it would be very very nice to have uh, and to understand what invariances they, do they satisfy and to see if those invariances can help us solve these problems a lot better. I mean a lot of analysis of real data in the world looks at things like time series analysis and such and such. What's the invariance of these properties that they are looking at? Okay. And uh, most of the property testing analysis has worked in the model where you are given oracle access to some function. You can always ask the value of the function at any point you want to but it doesn't work like I said in the genomics example. I cannot just say here is a genome does it exhibit this disease or not. We only have some restricted inputs on which you can uh, you have the value of the function. It would be very interesting to uh, enrich property testing to be able to address those kinds of cases. Okay. All right, so let me stop here. Thanks. Right, okay. okay. Good question. So the question was mostly, I mean, do we have any complexity uh, uh, obstacles? In fact, uh, I must say, uh, I'm sorry to have not stressed this earlier, I completely ignored complexity considerations in the talk today. Mostly because 
on the one extreme, we are really interested in asking the question, when can some infinite family of functions, where there is a parameter and it is growing, be tested with a constant number of queries. Okay, so, we were only looking at sample complexity, not really at the, so the, as far as I know, there has not been a very rich study of uh, uh, complexity of running the queries themselves. For many of the graph properties, for instance, uh, we often have the case where the property that we are testing for, is it graph 3 colorable? I mean, clearly it is, if you wanted to do the exact decision problem, that is very, very hard. Uh, that is at least NP hard, okay. But because there is a variation in the question, we are only asking is there a nearby graph that is three colorable? Our analysis by thing is saying there is, yes, I mean, an efficient algorithm which runs in time linear in the size of the graph and uh, some huge function of the error parameter, maybe, which says is a graph close to being three colorable or not. Uh, so most of the things tend to have. If you have constant query complexity, then at least non-uniformly you have a very efficient algorithm and then uh, often also uh, uniformly you do. The thing that I would, a second point that I want to say in that con context is once you get, I mean just because you are a graph property does not make you immediately testable. What you can do is immediately get a perfect cl classification. Here is the properties which are going to be nicely testable and here is the cl class which is not going to be nicely testable. So that is the separation that you can get, constant locally testable and or not. And this separation exists in several of these classes, uh, in algebraic property testing and things and so on. So we are getting more and more of the separation, but it is not, we get examples of hardness in graph property testing, it is a complete classification. In other cases, you get sort of, you know, and these, these things point to hardness, but it is not a classification. Right. So it's something like the bus flew long before. Can you give us a connection between the liquid polynomial and the non polynomial? So, yeah, so there is, by the way, the, uh, uh, a collection of analyses of functions that seem to behave under local observations like low degree polynomials, but turn out not to do that. Uh, and, but those typically seem to be about, uh, I don't know what's the exact cl class of functions that are doing this, but it seems to be somewhat different. And I was asked this question also uh, in other contexts. I mean, is there a connection between those and lifted things? And the difference seems to be those non-classical polynomials actually do violate some local constraints. It's just not enough. The lifted co codes are violating no local constraints. So it, they are, in fact, sort of somehow uh, very different from, I think, uh, the non-classical polynomials. The non-classical polynomials sort of give you obstacles to testing because they say they violate only few constraints and there's, because they violate only a few, it's going to be hard to detect. But if we can somehow go around them by some other means, then maybe you can get around them. In the lifted case, there's nothing you can do except by adding new constraints, but the new constraints turn out to be very expensive to add. Uh, the lifted codes, would they pass Gower's test? I did not think about it. Uh, notice that typically when you are thinking about say a polynomial of degree D, let us say we are thinking of a polynomial of degree 5 over the field on 8 elements. Okay. The Gower's test would query 32 points because it is 2 or 64 points, it is 2 to the D plus 1. I would consider, uh, you know, restricting the function on a line which would be only 8 points. So, you know, I mean, you can see that, okay, in this case 8 squared is 64, so I got to the same number unfortunately, but in general if I, in a lifted code, if I fail with a certain dimensional test and I double the dimension, and I have enough information it works out. In a, uh, the Gower's test is already asking exponentially many queries. Is there any room for uh, I don't know, restricted or non-trivial uh, 
So two, two transitives is not enough. Two transitives is not enough. Is there a nature which extends to? Mm, okay, that's a good question. I, you know, we try to understand what kinds of transitivities might be sufficient. I mean, you know, two transitivity, though I say it's not enough, you know, a fine invariance, I would almost say, look, they asked the question the wrong way, and if they had asked it right, this might have worked out, or some such thing. So I'm almost willing to give it there. Uh, the thing that is problematic is, I mean, you can talk about slight weakenings of invariant of symmetries, which preserve two transitivity, but are not a fine invariant. And even there, it seems to be very hard to prove things. So I don't have an explicit family of functions uh, written down, but I remember thinking about it at some point. There are these families of functions that are very richly symmetric, almost algebraic, and we don't know of a good analysis of the tests over there. So things turn out to be uh, very, very, very delicate around here. A fine invariance works perfectly, and then a little bit beyond seems to be very shaky. Sasha, and then yeah. <coughs> so, sorry, about this homomorphism test you started with. Imagine we want to separate things which are uh, the closest homomorphism identities. Four persons far and things which are it's five persons far. Ah, okay, Is good, good. Or not? Okay, good, good, good. So something that I think Ilan and, uh, and co-authors have worked on a lot is something called tolerant property testing. I didn't mention this in this talk, but Quite often you might be interested in saying, look, I'm not interested in this particular green region, but I take the gray region and split it into the portions closer to the green are colored green, the portions closer to the red are colored red. And then you say, I really want to accept everybody who's even 4% close. For if, if you happen to have, in the, in the case of linearity, you can do this. In general, you can do this for a certain class of codes which are, if the codes are locally decodable and testable, then you can actually measure the distance up to a certain point to uh, the property and then you ask the question, okay, once I can estimate the distance, I can. So estimation is a somewhat harder problem than uh, uh, testing. Estimating how far you are from the property is a somewhat harder pro problem than testing. Uh, for some classes it's harder and for some classes it's not. No, no, but conceptually it's easier. Conceptually it's harder, exactly. And, uh, and so, and you can, you can find many cases where it actually becomes strictly harder and uh, there are some cases where you somehow get rescued by things like local decoding, which is a completely unrelated feature to local testing, but happens to be true for the homomorphisms. It's also true for the graph, for, for all graph. For, I see, okay. Yeah, tolerant testing is doable whenever testing. Even estimation. Even estimation. Okay. So, and, and if, for example, we have in, in n dimensional space, we have exponential many points, and we want to, to check that the 99 versions of them are in some subspace of dimension and not in a smaller dimension. Uh -huh. Is it possible or not? Uh, Local. Uh, so, you uh, know, so if, if you're going over the rails, then I have no clue to the answer. Uh, if we are looking over finite, uh, the points are in some 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 space. Subspace can, can and we find the space of uh, find that it exists or yeah. right uh, or no? Uh, it's a under so it's a product of linear forms, right? Right. Right. Uh, so my sense would be that, I mean, I haven't looked at that question directly, so my sense would be over finite spaces and all, we should be able to do this with, I mean, by just sort of pretending that, uh, uh, you know, when I sample all the points, I should just get the right number from the narrow subspace. So I, right. yeah, or maybe subspaces is, is the uh, Right, so, yeah, so actually I haven't thought about this. My, my guess would be that if you want to... But just in, coding, in terms of coding theory, if we know that many points, except one or, or except several percentage, are in, in small dimensional space, can we find this space? Uh, I see, just as a coding question, Sergey, you're the one that I should be asking this, right? I mean, but what if we 
I think even if you look at all the points. I think it's a, a function which you say where is the i point and it tells you where it lies. So, so that's a very different model. Right, yeah. It's, uh, so it's probably not close to the model, but actually, Sergei, you should. Uh, I think you do, but we'll, <laughs> we'll debate this later, I guess. Any other? Uh, I don't know of any, any example of a linear property which I can do by, by uh, queries. I mean, it, it, very soon you get to extremely hard things like learning parity with noise and so on, and so it turns out to be a uh, very tricky thing. Okay. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> so you, you'll see more of this later. I, it's a technique I've learned from some of my students. So. <laughs> 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 oh, all right, thanks. Maybe, brother, you have a question because I'm outside of the world. But uh, so, to what kind of so when you speak about algebraic properties, to what kind of what classes of structures you actually? mean to apply this. So how general is this concept of algebraic property? And does it apply to general finite models of some? No. So, so I'm going to be, uh, in this uh, investigation, the only things that we've been looking at are functions from finite dimensional vector spaces over big fields yeah. to potentially small fields. Okay. And uh, properties, my definition for algebraic for today, in retrospect, should have been its uh, vector space of properties. And it's invariant under the affine transformation. I mean, that seems to be, I mean, it's a retrofitted de definition. We said, here is something algebraic, here is something else that's algebraic, here is something that's algebraic. And if you look at all of those and try to unify them, this was what captured them. There may be other examples of things that would be reasonable to consider algebraic. Uh, those do not, uh, those I was not trying to get to. Uh, the one interesting thing that we didn't do is quite often in algebra, it's uh, common to assume that you know if you have an algebraic property that should be some parameter like a degree or an order and when you take two functions of a given order and you multiply them the order of the new thing is also small bounded by the sum of these two but the degree should be of two the product of two polynomials is bounded by the sum of the degrees this is a feature that we did not use today and it was very important that we did not use it for some of the later results Okay, thanks. Well, since this is the last uh, talk, let's also end by thanking the conference organizers and staff as well. Yes. Yeah.